Good morning. Wow, that was loud. Hi, everyone. My name is Kim Sheldon, and I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. I'm also the panel lead for Risking It All Why Championship Athletes Dope and What It Means for Sport. I'm thrilled to introduce to you today our distinguished panel of guests, Tyler Hamilton, former professional cyclist and New York Times bestselling author, and Travis Tygott, CEO of the US Anti Doping Agency. Bonnie Ford is our moderator today, and she has covered doping extensively throughout her illustrious career. Our panel will last until 10 a.m., and as I'm sure you all know by now, you can text or tweet your questions to us. Uh, if you haven't learned the code by now, here it is again. Uh, to text, text 22333 with the keyword risks, that's risks with an S, and your message. And if you want to tweet, tweet at poll, and then risks, and whatever question you have. And please don't forget to hashtag SSAC14. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Bonnie. Thanks so much. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for being here. I know it's a very competitive time slot with a lot of interesting content elsewhere, but uh, I selfishly think this is the place to be this morning. Part of that is uh, because these two men, who I have the pleasure of staring, sharing the stage with, have never appeared publicly together before. And in fact, the last time they shared space in any sort of formal setting, they were adversaries before two different arbitration panels during Tyler's, uh, two, or Tyler's original uh, doping case back in 2004, 2006. I would have bet heavily at one time against the probability of them ever sharing space willingly, much less having the mutually respectful relationship that they have now. So I'm gonna start with the personal and ask each of them to uh, just reveal a little bit about how they came to find common ground. Tyler, first, you've uh, spoken in many interviews and also written in your book about the turning point in your life that came when you were subpoenaed uh, before a federal grand jury in the Armstrong, uh, then active criminal investigation back in 2010. That was the beginning of the end of your double life. Exactly. How did that, uh, come to change your attitude towards the doping culture and towards people like Travis who are on the other side? Yeah, that's a great question, great question. Like, as you said, um, I never imagined us sitting side by side either. And uh, yeah, we've certainly come, come full circle. You know, when, um, when USADA first started in, I believe, the year 2000, yeah, it was, uh, you know, I was already up to my neck in, in doping. and. Uh, yeah, I was not a big fan of USADA or, you know, getting caught. I was, you know, during my career, I was more worried about getting caught than actually winning bike races. And, um, you know, the, yeah, the reason for that was, yeah, I, I knew my life would come crashing down had I tested positive. And, um, but it's come full circle now. It's like, and, you know, once I came out with the truth, I had this massive weight on my back. And when I t finally told the truth for the first time, it was, you know, the, the veil was let down. I was able to take two, three, four steps back and look at the big picture and, you know, I was, I was caught up in a kind of a sick world. And I was a able to take a few steps back and um, Travis really welcomed me with open arms and um, yeah, the relationship has changed dramatically. And, um, it's been wonderful, wonderful. I, I, um, I feel very honored to, to be here today and, and uh, <coughs> to be a supporter of USADA. Travis, this is uh, a gentleman who fought you tooth and nail, tried to discredit by every means possible the case against him. How is it that you feel that he has something to offer? And uh, how did hearing the truth from him and others at that time possibly influence the way you looked at the culture of doping in professional sport? Yeah, you know, first let me just say it's, it's great to be here, and Tyler, thanks for um, agreeing to sit up here, I guess, for all the people that came to see us duke it out here on the stage are going to be disappointed this morning. Um, certainly that wasn't part of the plan, but, but I think this, t in all seriousness, I think this topic is really important because, you know, the, the analytics are only as good as the, the foundation upon which they're based, and if they're not pure, if there's influences like covert influences, especially like drugs that influence the numbers particularly, then everything else you're doing at this conference is, is almost rendered meaningless to a certain extent. So I, so I really appreciate um, MIT and, and the conference for putting this 
program on the agenda, I, I think there is critically important to talk about the underlying foundation of what sport is and what it's supposed to be, because necessarily the economic value of it, the analytic analysis of it um, is based on what is really going on in that sport. And you're going to hear firsthand if you haven't read his book or heard um, exactly what's going on in some sports today, given the win at all cost pressure. And, and Bonnie, to directly answer your question, I think when you hear the stories like Tyler, and we heard 11 other athletes that were on the U.S. Postal Service's team, and we, we heard firsthand you know, the, the culture that they were put in and the pressure that they were put under to use these dangerous performance enhancing drugs. And, and we knew after hearing those stories, one, you're, you're frustrated, two, you're, you're disappointed, obviously, Three, if you value sport and you're in a position like I'm in, you have to you know, commit to doing everything possible to ensure that no other athlete has to face the same difficult decisions that every athlete during that time period in the sport of cycle had to decide, which was become a fraud, use dangerous drugs in order to achieve your athletic dream. That's no sport that we should you know, stand back and allow um, a culture like that, a culture of corruption to, to grow within and put athletes in that difficult position. And so we, hearing their stories and, 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 and hoping to welcome them into the tent to help us try to change the culture of that sport in order that no other athlete had to face that decision is, is a no-brainer, for, frankly, for someone in my position if they truly care about sport and care about people. But speaking of changing the culture, Tyler, you've been invited uh, with USADA's blessing. U.S. National Junior Swim Team. What was it like to address those young athletes? What kind of feedback and questions did you get from them? Yeah, I mean, certainly they um, they were there with, with the, certainly open ears. Um, you know, and for me, I, I thought the, the best thing to tell these guys, these kids, young kids, was um, not necessarily don't dope because you know everybody here, all the young kids these days hear that, but more about my experiences, how I led a double life, how I you know, lied to my parents, you know, all the people closest to me lied straight to their faces for you know, years, years and years. Um, and the toll it took on me and my whole family. I mean, it's been, it's been a wild ride. And um, you know, how it felt better giving back my gold medal than actually receiving it. You know, like I said before, like I was more worried about getting caught than actually winning races. Yeah, it took a huge toll, toll on me, and um, you know, it, it, I told you know whether or not they make it in sport or business or whatever, whatever it is. Like you're going to come to a big crossroads in your life, and you need to be prepared for that. And take take a few steps back now and kind of start to think about those things. And um, you know, I wish I had. I, I didn't. I didn't. And uh, you know, when I was coming into the professional, um, when I went up to the professional league. You know, nobody warned me. No, I had no warning about what, what I was about to, that secret room I was about to be invited into. Um, and I wish I had kind of been warned a little bit and wish I had time to kind of think about it. And, um, but hopefully I can help. Hopefully, you know, my stories and other, other athletes' stories can help. Law enforcement investigations have been as important, if not more so, than actual testing in breaking open some of the big cases of the last decade, uh, notably Valco, Armstrong, and now uh, there's an ongoing investigation into the biogenesis case in baseball. You, Travis, now have the ability to sanction athletes in the absence of a positive test with uh, evidence gathered in, in other ways. Is testing less important than it used to be? And, and what is your relationship now with the law enforcement agencies that are uh, working in this area of sports and doping? Yeah, I, I think you know, testing's still the backbone of what we do, given that we're a non-governmental entity and have only private um, sort of investigative <coughs> powers. I, I think you, you take a step back from it and appreciate that the testing, or in really the overall anti-doping program, is there to deter athletes from using these drugs. So, so to convince them that you don't need these drugs in order to win. And I think if you took away testing, you would frankly see what you see in some sports today, um, unfortunately, or some sports, you know, think of baseball prior to 2003, there was no testing. And you really didn't have a choice but to use the drugs during that time as others within the sport started using the drugs. Now baseball has obviously flipped the switch and has turned the light on, so to speak, and has a, you know, a program that's 
quite different than what it was back then, and I think you see the benefits of it. But it's to deter, ideally, prevent athletes from using these drugs. And in the event that athletes succumb to that temptation, and, and let's make no mistake, the temptations are huge, and the pressures are enormous on athletes, partic particularly when the culture turns a blind eye and is okay because money is being made, home runs are being hit, speeds in the peloton are increasing, the growth of the sport is happening, they really don't want to necessarily police themselves in that sense and have to bring discipline against a, a star player. And so you have to also have a mechanism that will detect a player in the event that they decide to use these drugs and expose them as you're allowed to under the rules, which is a, a, a critical piece of the deterrent mechanism as well as per, you know, uh, put in place a, a, a sanction that you know, ultimately goes towards protecting the athletes who make the decision not to fall to the temptation and use these drugs in order to cheat. The, the law enforcement um, cooperation is one aspect of obtaining information. I mean, keep in mind, in our US Postal Service's case, we, we ultimately never got any information that we legally are allowed and would have legally been allowed to obtain. There's certain information like grand jury information that we're not legally allowed to obtain as a private entity but there are rules in place and actually a, a treaty, the UNESCO treaty here in the United States, that gives us access to otherwise legally available information, which could include a lot of investigative material. So sport has to also recognize that just because you might legally be entitled to it, you're not necess necessarily going to achieve it or obtain it, and you have to be prepared to do the job that you're gonna do. And, and I think baseball found themselves in a similar position with biogenesis. And while there might be you know, an ongoing, as reported, an ongoing criminal investigation, um, that's been sitting out there for you know, several years now, and baseball needed to move immediately. And I think you have to give Commissioner Selig and Rob Manfred and their team a lot of credit for going to you know, the links to obtain the information and then holding the number of players ultimately responsible that were cheating the other players within the league and cheating, quite frankly, defrauding all of us who are big fans of baseball. So you, you can't let you know, a lack of information sharing with the federal government stop sport from protecting itself. Because at the end of the day, at least here in the US, we are, it is a private organization not run by government organizations. At the other end of the spectrum from pro sports, uh, USADA has uh, had an increasing number of positive tests in the master's realm. And there's a tendency almost to chuckle when, when we see this, oh, haha, ha, this 62-year-old guy was doping and won a race. But there's some serious intent, certainly, behind uh, USADA's program. I thought I would start, though, with Kyler. You coach amateurs. You doped to compete and to advance at the elite level. Is it hard for you to get your mind around the fact that weekend warriors are doing this? Um, I mean, just in general, I think the, the, the Especially here in the United States, we have the, our culture is all about you know winning. I think there's a ton of pressure to win um, these days, whether it's in sport, business, uh, whatever it is. I mean, you see it in high school, you see it you know uh, in middle school. Um, it's huge pressure, and that's um, so. No, I'm not really surprised. I'm not really surprised. But um, yeah, I coach weekend warriors, and to be honest, um, I don't even coach. I have a um, someone who does that all for me and um, it's, um, but you know, we make sure from the beginning that they know the rules and um, it's all about enjoying the bicycle, having fun with it. Um, you know, doping certainly, there's, there's, no, there's no room for that anymore. Do you think it's worth pursuing? Oh, ab masters oh, and amateurs? oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you have to, you have to. It's you know, all sport needs some police, some sort of policing for sure. And, and Travis, it, why you you get flack sometimes? I know for why are you pursuing this? Why are you expending resources on this right. when the big fish are slipping through the net? So right. would you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, well, one, we don't react to flack, I guess, right? Or <laughs> we yeah. we wouldn't have done the job that we do in these tough cases. And, and make no mistake, they are tough. And having to bring a case against someone like Tyler Hamilton, who, what finished, won a gold medal, finished third in the tour that year, or a Lance Armstrong, those are those are not easy things to do. And and you only do it, I think, if you have a commitment to what your your vision and your goals for your entity and for clean athletes are to protect their rights to compete on a level playing field. So so it's never easy. Um, I I think you know we have done testing at both the Masters as well as the Junior 
level, and I think both of those levels fall, that fall outside of our elites, we've got about 2,500 athletes that I would say are the elite of the elite that are in our regular out of competition testing pool. You know, you saw 230 of them on our Winter Olympic team. You'll see another 600 on our Summer Olympic team again. But outside on either, you know, end of that group, you've got the masters and you've got the juniors. I mean, we had a 14-year-old inline roller skater. We didn't even know it was a sport, quite frankly, until he came out to Colorado Springs and was tested at an event because he was going to the Junior World Championships. And it's a Pan Am discipline. There's actually a lot of crossover now between inline roller skating and speed skating on Sweet. the ice. But this 14-year-old was on one of the most sophisticated programs that we've seen at that level, um, testosterone, human growth hormone, insulin. And it was all being driven by his dad and his coach and his trainer. All three of them ended up being charged. Fortunately, the dad served some time in prison for distribution of these drugs to a minor. But, but the purpose and the reason behind giving an inline roller skater Again, no money, no fame, was this dad was a corporate America type and he loved to walk around his office and brag about his son being on the Junior World Championship team. And I think unchecked, our culture has dictated winning is everything, the spoils go to the winner, nothing really goes to second or third place finishers. And it's not how you win, it's just winning. And, and that's the culture that I think we saw in cycling, certainly, and we see, you know, rising up at, 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 all, at all levels. The, the master's testing are, you know, quite frankly, event organizers and athletes who have said, we're working just as hard as everyone else, and we don't want someone to come cheat us. Maybe it's just a few points on the race season. Maybe it's a couple hundred dollars at yeah. a, a local criterion, but at the end of the day, you know, whether someone's putting a small engine in their bike to gain an advantage, whether they're taking a subway six miles of the marathon and getting off and finishing, you know, an unfair advantage is something as athletes, they don't, they don't want to have to tolerate. So I think, I think we've got to, you know, one, reinstill this idea that yes, winning is important and yes, we want to win, but how we win is more important than just simply winning. And if you win by fraud or by gaining an unfair advantage over your competitors, that's not a win. You're, you're still a loser when you attempt to do that. I have an analytics question. Yes, we're getting to analytics. <laughs> uh, I don't know how many in the audience here are amateur riders themselves, uh, but if you follow cycling at all, you know that there's an increasing number of analyses these days that use power numbers, gradients of climbs, times of climbs, VO2 max, and a bunch of other variables to essentially construct an argument as to whether rider X is clean. And there's been a lot of debate about how useful those analyses are. And I, I'd really love to hear from both of you, are, are the numbers, do the numbers really make a case? Uh, are, are we able now to look at what we see in a Tour de France broadcast and make an informed, educated guess about whether Rider X is clean. You want to start with that? Yeah, yeah sure. You, uh, look, I think they're, I think they're I, one, I think all athletes are entitled to the presumption of innocence until and unless the legal process declares them to have committed a violation. And we have an independent arbitration system, independent judges that ultimately ruled on Tyler's case. It's not us at USADA that makes the determination. In Lance Armstrong's case, he decided not to challenge the evidence that we presented, so the, the result automatically went into effect, and, and that was his legal right to, to do so. He could have challenged it, as Tyler did, um, challenged it to independent arbitrators. So, so I think that's a really important point. Um, that said, Bonnie, I think those types of matrix, those types of analytics, um, are really important for anti-doping organizations to look at. They're not, at this point, the determination of whether someone is clean or not, but certainly they, those types of factors, including a whole host of others, are relied upon us every day in order to, at a minimum, direct our tests, but also might be part of the overall investigative package, whether there's a positive test or not, that ultimately is presented to independent arbitrators who can make a determination of whether someone has you know, cheated the sport and gained an unfair advantage 
through doping or, or not. So short answer is I think they're very important. I don't think they can be used to, you know, call into question some, a performance or necessarily to fully exonerate a person, but they're important to be used by the authorities, that's us in, in Olympic sport and pro cycling, um, in order to you know, ensure that we're doing our job to detect as well as deter any athlete that's attempting to, to cheat the system. Yeah, and I mean, they can use the, these, some of these numbers to, to target. You know, they have a huge pool of athletes to test, and, you know, they, I mean, you want to test the, try to test the cheaters. And if, if you're seeing some surprising numbers, I mean, I, I can go back during my career, you know, both training numbers and, and the numbers I had in the races, like, yeah, there was probably a couple of really good times to target me to, to test me. <laughs> you never did, unfortunately, but, like, um, <laughs> but, yeah. We can go, I could go back and show you my, some of my training numbers. And yeah, it was, there were times like uh, I should have been on that targeted list. Um, and, and I just add, I mean, in, in the, the WADA, we follow the WADA code, which, you know, 400 sport organizations around the world, maybe with the exception of the, the five pro sports here in the US, 175 governments have all agreed that the WADA code is the uniform and best policy to provide the, the most robust, it's not perfect, but the most robust anti-doping program to protect the rights of athletes and their equal opportunity to compete. And within that, there's an international standard for testing that actually identifies 10 plus factors and certainly you know, performances, um, good performances coming off of an injury, coming out of retirement and having similar performances or increases in performances. Those types of factors are you know, specifically within the, the testing documents to guide organizations like like ours to you know consider those analytics if you want to call them that those factors in order to you know better enhance your intelligent or as Tyler said your target yeah. and maybe testing. being vague on your whereabouts list like, yeah um, you know uh, yeah tell them how tell them how that works yeah we used to have to send in our whereabouts you know 365 days out of the year uh, you'd have to t tell USADA where you're going to be and so they can come surprise test you at any time so you know in the early days when they were still kind of getting everything uh, organized with the out of competition testing yeah it would just be as vague as possible and um, you know by the time they caught on you know it was already a little already too late but you know today today they have this uh, biological passport so it's it's a, a much better system but back then yeah we could be really vague on our whereabouts and um, you know nine times out of ten they weren't you know uh, Asking for more inf information, so or you could drop to your stomach in your kitchen. Yeah, or you could drop to your as you <laughs> stomach in, your, in book, your kitchen when somebody um, knocks on your door to test. One you. of the more dramatic scenes in the book, yeah, actually. So, so we we have we've touched on the other leagues and the WADA code a little bit. We have parallel universes, really, in, in professional sports uh, in this country. We have leagues with a system of some testing better than others, but sanctions certainly that put players back on the field much more quickly. Are these two systems ever gonna look more like each other, Travis? Do you see that movement coming? And, and obviously, you know, when you put players back on the field quicker, it has an impact on how fans receive those sanctions. They're not gonna be taken as seriously. Yeah. You, you know, I, uh, I mentioned earlier, 400 sports around the world have signed the WADA code. Again, it's, it, it needs to continue to evolve and we all need to implement it even more effectively than we currently are. It's part resource driven, part you know, uh, tolerance driven, but w I, I think the, the pro sports um, are not following the WADA code. Importantly, their athletes from time to time, particularly the ones that play in the Olympic games, are held to the WADA code. So I don't think the athletes have any problem with it. Think of the redeemed team that won the gold medal in Beijing and then again in Olympics. All those NBA players were subject to our jurisdiction, subject to the WADA code 12 months before the Olympic Games. And I think that's a powerful statement that the athletes themselves don't have any problem with it. I think unfortunately it's gotten trapped up, particularly in um, you know, football, NCAA to a certain extent, um, NBA, NHL, trapped up in you know, the collective bargaining process, and it ends up just being something that's a, a, a chit to bargain at the very end of otherwise very contentious labor management process, and, and frequently is the last thing that they start talking about. And, and unfortunately, with the exception of baseball, those other organizations, including the NCAA, 
you know, are, are far behind where the rest of the world is. There is no blood testing. And I've said it before, if, if you, as a competitive athlete, if you're in a system, NCAA, uh, NBA, Major, well, Major League Baseball tests for blood, um, so exclude them, but NFL, and there's no chance you're gonna get caught using human growth hormone, and human growth hormone is a performance enhancing substance that is gonna give you not only recovery, but, but lean muscle mass, you're, you're not being competitive, I don't think. And that's the reality of the stories you hear from people like Tyler and all the other athletes in competitive environments that we've heard. And, and you know other people are doing it within those leagues. And so good, decent people that otherwise want to abide by the rules, now we're put in a position where they're not gonna make the team. They're not gonna be able to feed their kids. They're not gonna be able to have the house that they wanna have. And all their hard work is gonna get undercut from them if they're not using human growth hormone. That is a, a basic cost benefit analysis applied to whether or not in those sports without blood testing, are you gonna use human growth hormone? And, and I think those, while the commissioner's office and football has been pushing really hard to have human growth hormone testing added to its menu, um, that's a critical issue that, that not only goes to the integrity of the game, but I think goes to want, you know, the, the rights of those players, but also to their health and safety. And, and it's unfortunate that those leagues haven't stepped up to the plate. And there's you know, a few other pieces of their program that we could talk about, but you know, I think you have to contrast that with, um, with baseball. It has put in human growth hormone testing in season, out of season. They obviously woke up after the 2003 survey testing that was done in the Balco scandal and have taken aggressive steps. And again, I think you have to give them a, a lot of, both the union as well as the commissioner's office, a lot of credit for putting in a program that is the closest one now that has not fully adopted the WADA code. And, and I think you see the players in that league, particularly after the biogenesis investigation, stepping up and saying, you know what, we, we want our 50 game suspension to go even more. And some chance, I think you'll see some announcements and changes to that program that will even give better protection to those clean athletes. But, but also keep in mind, you know, in the A-Rod case, an intentional set of facts where an athlete was doing things to defeat the testing program, obstructing the process, ended up resulting in a, a season loss and what 25, you, you guys would know better than me, but $25 million um, being lost and you can't under, undervalue the, the impact that's gonna have on future generations of athletes who do not want to be the next A-Rod in, in Major League Baseball. Tyler, uh, as we speak, you are under an eight-year competitive ban, and that occurred because you had a second doping offense uh, back in 2008. After everything you had been through with your first case, you crossed the line again yeah. several times. Yeah. And when you spoke about that um, at the time it happened, you linked it very closely with your lifelong struggle with clinical depression. Yeah. Are we paying enough attention? Does there need to be more discussion of the interface between doping and dependency and depression and the psychological dependency that, that elite athletes who dope um, have with performance enhancing drugs? Right. You mean I suffer with clinical depression? I, you know, I basically was born with it, um, but obviously I have situational depression as well at times. And, uh, yeah, obviously all the, taking all the performance enhancing drugs, you know, uh, you know, testosterone, for example, is, you come, you can come off like a high and, uh, and then you can get, you can fall into a really low trough after, you know, using testosterone. Um, I think there are a lot of athletes that, that, that suffer from the, from depression. Um, and no, it's not really addressed. It's, and to be honest, it's kind of, yeah. I didn't, to be honest, I never shared uh, my depression the truth about my depression with any anybody in sport back then, you know, I didn't want to. I didn't want to. Um, you know, I, I was the leader of a team of my teams, and I didn't want. Um, yeah, I guess I wasn't really prepared for it. It's something I wasn't comfortable talking about. Um, but yeah, it, it, I, my uh, when I was I was officially diagnosed with depression in two thousand and three, and from the outside, you know, I just finished fourth overall in the Tour de France. I won a stage. I came back to the United States to parades in my hometown, you know, ringing an opening bell on Wall Street, throwing out the first pitch at the Red Sox game, um, you know, 
morning shows, all that stuff. Just signed a new two-year contract with a with a big team, and uh, I had everything in the world to be happy about. So from the outside, it looked like you know life was good for me, and you know I couldn't even get out of bed. So um, just goes to show you that uh, you know your performances on the bike and you know the, the salary you're making doesn't you know doesn't mean a whole lot. But know, was was part of that, Tyler? How much of it was? This is ill-gotten gains. I'm cheating. I'm I'm leading this double life. Did did that play into it, or is that something that we see from the outside? Uh, I think I struggled with it the whole time. Like I was saying before, I worried more about getting caught than you know winning races. You know, um, it was a constant, a constant thought. You know, just at night. You know, in the middle of the night, my you know I call them uh, committee meetings. In the middle of the night, you wake up and you just you know you're fighting with yourself. You know, you're in your double life. Um, it was just a constant stress, and like, I'm so, I'm, I was so, I'm so happy to be just where I am today, with it, you know, finally, finally being, telling the truth, and finally doing the right thing. Um, yeah, it, it, living a double life is, is uh, certainly, I mean, it's not for anybody, for one, but someone who, who's suffering from depression, it's, it's, uh, it's really a double-edged sword, so. Travis, did you want to weigh in on that? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, yeah. that what he just said is a is a common theme that you hear. The, the double life aspect yeah. is a common theme that we heard throughout um, our investigation. And and I, and I think you go back to, you know, what is, what is sport? And, at, you know, at this level and what this conference is about is sort of the elite of the elite and the, you know, but the money as well as the numbers around professional sport. But every one of these athletes, at least here in the U.S., really grows up just like, you know, a kid on Christmas waiting to get their bike so they can go out and ride around the neighborhood and, and you know, race their friends. And, and they just take it to the next step, the next step, the next step. And, and it's crushing, I think, if you see sport as a teacher of life lessons and, and not just an economic machine that can put, you know, money in people's pockets. It, it ought to, we ought to be really frustrated and disappointed to hear the types of stories that, that Tyler just talked about and, and, and that we heard I think is a common theme throughout our um, investigation. You know, from a health standpoint, I think I, I think there has to be a discussion around that. And you know, the depression, um, you know, the suicide; those are those are classic sort of textbook side effects of the abuse of anabolic, um, you know, steroids. And and you see a lot of that happening across the board and other sports as well. And and I think we really have to get, um, you know, have a, a real discussion about the causes of some of those deaths. Um, and the, the health effects that are coming about from it and, and, and really determine if, you know, the, the, the drug use is playing, you know, what role, what exact role the drug use is playing with respect to some of those ailments. Well, the life of an athlete by nature is full of adrenaline spikes and highs and lows. So what you're describing, it certainly sounds as if the use of drugs, recreational drugs or performance enhancing drugs could, could play into that and feed it. Absolutely. Uh, Lance Armstrong, the beast in the room here, um, has given a number of recent interviews where he said he felt unfairly singled out uh, in terms of the penalty he received by comparison to his teammates who cooperated with the investigation uh, who received reduced sanctions. I'd like to hear from both of you, Tyler first. Um, is he different? Should he have been treated differently, and why? Uh, well, Lan I mean, as far as I know, as far as what I've read, and um, yeah, he's, he was given every every opportunity to come in and tell the truth, like I was. Um, yeah, he he chose not to. You know why? Why I'm not sure, but um, yeah, he had every every opportunity to come in and tell the truth, and you know, he um, he's yet to do that. You know, hopefully one day he will, because he there's a lot of information still out there that um, you know we've only, I think this we've only hit the tip of the iceberg, and there's a bit you know there's a big network underneath, and he's got a lot of information, and um, he needs to come in. He needs to come in and talk to Travis and fully, you know, unload. I uh, you know I feel for him. I lied for a long time, even after I was caught, I kept lying, and so it's a process. I I understand that. You know, he has told the truth on, you know, did he dope? Yes, he did for the seven tour victories. But he needs to come in and give the, this, you know, 
there's a lot of information, a lot of people involved in this whole thing. And he knows the names. He, you know, he knows where those bodies are buried. You know? um, but he, he should feel fortunate. He's, you know, there's a lot of people in jail that have done a lot less than uh, a lot less crimes than he's done. So, um, you know, I think he needs to do the right thing and, you know, do it for the future generations. That's the way I feel now. It's like, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't go on with these lies. I, you know, luckily I was subpoenaed finally, so I felt like I, I had to tell the truth. I was forced to tell the truth. Um, you know, up, at, up until that point, I, I thought, there's no, it's a lose, lose, lose situation for me if I tell the truth. If I tell the truth, I'm going to get blackballed from the sport of cycling. I'll serve my suspension, but I'll never come back. So nobody will ever let me in. Because there's a bit of an omerta, a code of silence within cycling. Like, you don't break that code. Um, you know, also, where was I going with that? Yeah, it's a lose, lose, lose situation. You know, I would have lost all my, uh, all, you know, I would have had to basically tell the truth on a lot of my, you know, friends, teammates, and, and cost a lot of careers. I would have ended a lot of careers. And, uh, you know, I also would have lost a lot of, you know, friends or acquaintances. And so, at the time, I thought, you know, up until Jeff Nowitzki from the FBI called me, or what, FDA? FDA. FDA called me. Yeah, I thought, I don't know, it was just, I thought, felt like I was way past the point of no return. I thought I was going to take these secrets to the grave and just live the rest of my life. Kind of, I don't know, just, I was... Yeah, the rest of my life wasn't going to be so so great. But in terms of, of Lance himself, you, yeah. you rode as a support rider for him. Yes. You rode as a team leader yeah. against him. Do you view his actions and his influence as different than other riders? Yeah, and we, yeah, do you have I mean, a problem with uh, the other riders, your former teammates, being offered reduced sanctions in return for their no, uh With the reduced sanctions, I think, I, th I think every individual case is different. Um, we, we, I think with the, have, if some, you get somebody to come in and tell the full truth, and uh, I think they should receive maybe a yeah, reduced sanction. You know, give them a second chance, forgive them, give them some sort of second chance. Uh, he was offered that. You know, these are the guys that came in and did that. You know, you you have to applaud them for coming in. It was hard, very difficult. Um, and you know, some some guys got some reduced sa sanctions. And you know, Lance had that opportunity, and he said on the Oprah Winfrey show that if he could go back. To, to that first time he was given that opportunity, he would have taken it. He told the truth. He would have kept, I don't know, I've heard three to five of his Tour de France victories, and you know he might be competing today in whatever sport he, he chose, but he, he did not. And he's, um, I don't know, he's going to have to live with that. I don't know, hopefully, you know, there's still time. I mean, never say never. I think um, it is a process. What about I, the argument that every other big rider of his time was doing the same thing? Does that impact you at all? Uh, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of us. When I first, my first Tour de France that I raced in was 1997. I believe there was 208 starters. I would be, you know, if there was, I don't think there was, there was at least 200 riders who were, I'd say, doped. And, um, you know, it was just, it was what we all did back then. It was what we all did, and it was part of the culture. When I first arrived in the big leagues, yeah, it was it was actually right out, kind of right in front of your face. And it wasn't until uh, the Festina affair, there was a big um, situation in France, uh, in the Tour de France, where they the police caught a French team with a, a carload of drugs, and that's that's when things kind of went really underground. After that, um, I don't know if that really answered your question, but yeah, he, it's time for Lance to come forward, you know. Everybody wants to forgive, and he, I think eventually he will be forgiven if he, if, if he does the right thing. You know, if he can't do it for himself, do it for his family. Do it for, do it for cycling. Do it for all the sport. So it's important. There's a, lot, there's a lot more information out there, unfortunately. Travis, the singled out argument, can you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's a, I guess, a pretty easy soundbite at this point, but there's, you know, no, no facts that... No, no analytics, no data that, that support it whatsoever. Um, as Tyler said, we ended up, in our case, seeing the, the culture set a goal, which was one, to ensure our Olympic team didn't have any riders on it, that we had evidence of their doping. That was the 2012 London Olympics, and we were able to 
have four to five athletes come off of that team that otherwise might have gone to the games, won medals, and then had to have those medals returned. So that was a, a priority of ours. This, the second priority, and still the priority today, was to attempt to dismantle the system, those within the sport ranks. And, and we knew in order to dismantle that system that allowed this corrupt culture to survive and rise up, we, we needed the athlete's support. And it's precisely why we went to every athlete, including Tyler, but all 11 others that came in at that time, and now many others have come in and said, listen, athletes, to a certain extent, you were the pawns in this whole scheme, and, if, and you were put in a culture that you know, almost compelled you while, yes, you made your choices, and some people within that pro peloton, Christophe Bassons, a Mer Scott Mercier, a Darren Baker, were the true victims, I think, because they didn't cheat, and they either had to leave the sport or they never won at a level that they otherwise probably could have won if it truly was a level playing field. And certainly a whole lot of other true victims left the sport and retired and went on to do other things in life, which is also a tremendous tragedy. And, and that's the true group of victims, I think. But looking at that system, we said the, the athletes who participated in it, one, are gonna have the information. They're gonna know how they beat the testing they're gonna know how the drugs affected their body and their performance, how they were able to transport blood transfusions across borders, particularly in certain countries over in Europe where it's a crime and the mechanism and the system that allowed them or enabled them to do that. And so we, at the very beginning of our investigation back in May of 2010, identified our second goal, the one we're still working on today, which is to dismantle that system and allow the athletes to come in and be part of that effort to dismantle the system. And, and as such, we decided to give every athlete, including Lance Armstrong, the opportunity to come in, be truthful with us, and receive the maximum benefit that the rules would allow at the time, which ended up being, for some of them, they had a two-year suspension going down to a six-month suspension. Obviously, they were gonna be exposed, disqualification results where it was appropriate, and, and he was given that same opportunity and was given numerous other opportunities to come in and do something similar. But you look at what we charged him with, as well as the team director, two team doctors, actually three team doctors, and the team trainer, those in the system, we charged based on the evidence. And while it's easy to say, Bonnie, as you did in your, your question, everyone else in the, system, in the sport was doing it, it's all based on the evidence. And go back to what I said previously about the importance of the legal process. If we have evidence of anyone else during that time that falls under our jurisdiction, we will bring a case. And if we don't have jurisdiction, we'll forward it to another entity around the world to bring a case. And so our case against Armstrong, as well as his co-conspirators, was based on the evidence that we had, and there was trafficking, there was distribution, there was use, there was possession, there was covering up. And those are, uh, those are all offenses under the global WADA code rules, and they are different than what many of the other athletes like Tyler or Levi or George or Floyd, what they did, which was just use these substances, and they didn't go so far as to do all the other offenses, and those offenses require up to a lifetime ban. And, and as I said previously also, um, Neil Armstrong was given and his attorneys full knowledge that independent judges, not USADA, would ultimately determine the sanction. He certainly could have challenged, you know, admitted everything, come in and challenge just the sanction if he felt it was too severe, and, and he chose not to do that. I, I think the reality is they, they, tried to, they tried to run the tables. Let's be honest about it. They tried to run the tables, and, and it didn't work because the truth and the power of the evidence was so strong, um, so they finally had to come around and admit to it, but the decision not to come in when given the opportunity, and there were numerous opportunities provided, um, you know, simply was too late, and, and they, they challenged um, the effort attempting to escape any consequence and, and really weren't in a position to admit the truth. All that said, let's hope at some point it happens. I think there's little, and I, I may disagree with you, Tyler, on that point. I think there's probably little information he has at this point that hasn't already been Provided, In fact, there's some lit litigation going on where he's given sworn depositions and really outside of the people that we've acknowledged already who have been sanctioned, he, he doesn't have any firsthand knowledge um, according to his sworn testimony in those cases. 
but on, but on a, a few additional people. Um, so I'm not sure the, the mountain of evidence that he would necessarily have is there, but there is a, you know, a global investigation uh, or process, a truth and reconciliation, so to speak, process that um, ultimately will try to obtain all the information of, on others that might be out there and, and try to bring some resolution to, to this chapter in, in Cyclone's history. Wow, we have some meaty questions here from the audience. <laughs> um, I'll start with, and obviously I did not hear this myself, but according to the questioner, fellow speaker Malcolm Gladwell said that in 50 years, substances, I assume performance enhancing substances, will be as accepted as other forms of performance enhancement like equipment and diet. Do you agree? I, 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 thank you for that question. I think it might be the most important one that we didn't touch on. But look, I think, one, it's rules-based. So whether you have a wood bat or an aluminum bat, it's based on the rules. What do you want sport to be? And let's, let's make it clear in the rules. If we're going to accept it, let's change the rules and let everybody know, every athlete, someone notice that you have to use these drugs at whatever level to get you the performance that you need in order to be competitive. That, that's fine. Let's, let's have that world and let's have that discussion. I, I think you don't want to go there, in my mind, for four pretty simple reasons. Number one, it's not going to be a level playing field. The drugs themselves affect different people in different ways. So it's not like handing everyone an aluminum bat. It's actually like handing one person an aluminum bat because their body actually responds to the drugs. They're a responder and it's like handing someone else a wood bat because, a pl plastic they, bat. because they don't respond yeah. well to the drugs. Responder, non-responder, and the athletes will, will tell you all about that if, if you read their affidavits or hear their stories. Number two, I think even if you set it at what might be considered a therapeutic or safe level, you're still gonna have athletes who are gonna gain an advantage. And so if 100 cc's of testosterone we get comfortable as a society is okay and safe, well, cheating athletes know that they're gonna gain more of an advantage by 300 cc's of testosterone. And so you're right back in that catch-22 trap. I think number three, it totally changes what we think of sport. We don't want to see cyborgs riding up the mountains in France. That's NASCAR or motocross, right? I mean, it's blurring the line between human performance and chemically enhanced mechanical cyborg performance. And then I think number four, and, and in my mind, as a father of three, whose kids are never gonna play professional sports, but who gain a lot of advantage from sport, life lessons, teamwork, courage, determination, hard work. If you have to use drugs to make the New England Patriots, then you're gonna have to do it to make the Alabama football team. And if you have to do it to make the Alabama football team, you're gonna have to do it to make your local high school team. And if you have to do it to make your local high school team, you're gonna have to do it at junior high. And so the question becomes, at what level are we willing to, one, pay the money, but two, inject our kids, give our kids untested drugs um, in order for them to make a, a team? And I think that is a slippery slope that while it might be easy and it might be a good, you know, high level, well, if they're all doing it, just let them do it anyway, I think there are four, you know, at least catastrophic consequences that come from that. And, and look, if there was an economic market for it, you'd see it today. In some sports, professional bodybuilding, they have open and closed categories. Open, you can use whatever drug you want. If there was a real economic market for it, I suspect you would already see that today. So we're not there yet, and, and we'll continue to fight hard not to get there. Um, but as long as the rules are the, the, the way they are, we ought to do everything possible to maintain um, exactly what we're saying we're producing, which is drug-free human performance. Yeah, and in 50 years, you know, your side is going to be 100 times bigger, you know, and the testing's going to be, everything's going to be that much better. And so that's it. I'm going to modify this one a little bit. The, the, uh, the question is, can we trust that the Peloton today is clean? Is the increased difficulty of races like the Tour de France, uh, does that make it impossible not to cheat? Tyler, I know you're not immersed in professional cycling anymore, but when you watch races or when you read about them, what do you look for as signs that things either haven't changed or are changing? And what yeah. would the Tour de France look like if it was clean? Uh, um, oh, good qu great question. Yeah, I don't really watch, it's kind of taken a little time off from the, the racing part of cycling. <laughs> uh, so I don't really watch it, but you know, I hear about, I hear about it from my friends. And, um, 
some of the weekend warriors that, um, that I ride with once in a while on the weekends. But um, it's, I, I kind of focus more on what the athletes are saying. And um, a lot of them are saying, still saying these days that, you know, cycling is totally clean and we can move on and, like, don't ask those questions about doping. You know, that to me is a, a red flag. And because um, it's not clean, they're still catching guys. And obviously, I mean, I do believe it's cleaning up and it's on, on, the, on the road to um, being a true clean sport. Um, but yeah, I think the Omerta, unfortunately, the code of silence, especially over in Europe where the top tier of cycling is, is um, I think it still is, exists. You know, and there, you know, there's still some, you know, black hats, so to speak, people like me who are still involved in the sport. Most of them have retired by now, but a lot are still, you know, directing teams, you know, managing teams. Uh, yeah, and it's a little bit, uh, it, con it concerns me, it concerns me. I, cycling is not 100% clean now, that's for sure. Um, I, you know, going back to, like, I don't think the race organizers make it much easier. This year, I don't know how many of you follow the Tour de France, but this year, with, like, two or three days to go, you know, after, you know, two and a half weeks of racing, they go up one of the, you know, hardest climbs in France, not once, but twice, you know. That to me, you know, after racing maybe 80 or 100 miles before that, um, you know, that to me is just, you know, that's not encouraging clean sport. And, you know, if they want to do something like that, do it in the first week of the Tour de France when you're fresh. Um, what, do you, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I think, uh, I, mean, know, actually, I, I think you've got to get, oh, nice go, yeah. you know, maybe let the athletes decide. You know, let that like, let the guys who did the last year's Tour de France decide what kind of race they want. And maybe uh, the Tour de France society can actually present them with some options. And what what do the athletes want? Well, you there's know, because I bet a lot of them would say, "I don't want to ride up Alpe d'Huez twice." <laughs> a lot of them, a lot of them will say, "I don't want to ride up once." But maybe like, <laughs> there's got to be, you know, the athletes here like are the pawns. You know, they're the pawns. You know, not too many riders were happy about. Well, that. there's there's the balance, right, between spectacle and yes. Uh, yes. trying to veer toward clean sport. And there's yeah. been um, quite a bit of chatter about a sign of cleaner cycling is that you don't see those spectacular attacks that happened, you know, in your era, whether it was yeah. Lance or somebody else dropping people on, on a mountain. The spectacle of eight guys kind of huffing up the uphill finish together is not as exciting, quote sure. unquote. Sure, sure. So, I mean, there has to be almost a management of fan expectations in cleaner sport, doesn't there? In yeah, I th look, I think it's that ba that balance between promoting and policing. When <laughs> when those who are wh whose job simply or fiduciary responsibility is to grow the sport, grow revenues, bigger TV contracts, bigger sponsorships, the, the last thing they're really concerned about, to a certain extent, is you know the the toll on the athletes or necessarily the other influences that are then driving unfair competition, such as drug use, such as the motors in the bike. So I, so I think that's the the hard tension between those two, you know, those two those two aspects of it. For Tyler, how should parents explain to our children? Cycling fans who watched and cheered, what really happened in those seven tours to France? It's a tough audience here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the open, I mean, I don't know. Um, tell them the whole story. Don't hold anything back. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty sad, the whole thing's a pretty sad story. Um, but I think a lot of people can learn from sort of our era of cycling. And, you know, the, again, the more we learn about the past, you know, the the better we're going to be in the, in, in the future. Um, yeah, share everything, share everything. You know, winning became everything. Win at all costs situation, you know. That's not how I grew up. Um, it started with one small little red testosterone pill and I think it was March of 1997. You know, that was just like a small little speck of dirt on my shoe, you know. Had they told me at that point, where I was going, where, where this was, this t testosterone pill was gonna lead, you know, I would have been on the first plane back to Boston. I, I got up to my neck in it. I almost drowned in this stuff, you know, it was crazy. Um, but once you cross that line, you know, 
what's to, who's to say why don't you maybe go a little bit more to the right and before you know it, yeah. It's kind of a sick circle, it's kind of a sick circle. Um, yeah, be honest with your kids, be honest with your kids about what happens, you know. You can learn, we can learn a lot from the history, you know, I certainly have. I'm a, I'm a much better person today all around because of what I've went through, you know. I've learned, I mean, the lessons I've learned are, you know, I couldn't have paid for it, that's for sure. So I feel, I feel lucky and fortunate. And, you know, I'll spend the rest of my life, you know, volunteering my time, trying to talk to, talk to the younger generations. You know, I think that age 12 through age 18, maybe a little bit older, uh, is super, super important. You know, those kids are still, you know, you can still kind of um, change their minds a little bit. Um, so, and uh, yeah, whatever I can do to help, I, I feel like it's, it's, it's the least I can do. We have time for one more. There's a yes? Okay. <coughs> when will the risks outweigh the rewards of doping? Lance and Marion Jones may be, considered, may be considered disgraced, but they still received glory and huge financial rewards. Either one of you. Look, I, I think in the Olympics, in our, in our world here in the U.S., under our jurisdiction, the, the risks of getting caught, exposed, disciplined, being seen as a fraud by everyone in the country um, is significant if you attempt to do it. And I think that is the cost-benefit analysis that um, some athletes go through, unfortunately. But I, I think as we continue to talk about the importance of winning the right way as opposed to just winning, you're going to even see more, of, uh, more good decisions even if you're using that cost-benefit analysis. But I think Marion Jones and Lance Armstrong, those are examples for the next generation of kids that you don't want to be a Lance Armstrong or a, a Marion Jones. Go win the right way. Yeah. And, you know, Mary Jones did six months in prison. Lance was, as Tyler mentioned, fortunate, you know, maybe not to be charged criminally, but that's not, that, those aren't the heroes that um, you want to grow up to, to be at this point. And I think they'd change it all to, like, take, take away all the fame, all the money, just to get back to some normalcy, really. Well, next year, uh, Lance and Marion here <laughs> on a panel. We'll, we'll get that done. I'll interview them. <laughs> I do, I have an analytics question if, if we have one more time for a minute more, okay. Because uh, I'm, I'm interested in your answer to this, Travis. Uh, what are the predictive trends in your data that can shed light on the future of doping in the U.S. or abroad? Look, I think the, uh, and, and Tyler mentioned we didn't get into it a whole lot, but the passport program, which is, you know, a, a, it's not a test for a direct drug in a person's blood or urine, but it looks at biological markers like hematocrit or hemoglobin reticulocytes. It's not unlike a cholesterol test for those of you who are, you know, 40 and over and get those regularly. You know, your doctor will tell you on day one if your cholesterol is at X level and then you show up 30 days later and it's at Y level and it's gone through the roof hey, you've been smoking and eating bad and not exercising, you need to change your habits. Well, that data is, is available and it's part of the passport program that Tyler mentioned. And, and I think you see changes in behavior through that data. And, and it's important for us to have access to that, both blood and urine. You see, I mentioned baseball is doing that similarly with, it's called a longitudinal or a passport approach. And, and that's very powerful data. I would love to see that one day get to the point and it's all based on the science and innovation on the science from both a collection and a uh, analysis standpoint, um, but get that to a position that can guarantee an athlete is clean. Because unfortunately, today, all someone can say is, I've passed X number of tests, and that doesn't give them, as we know, the guarantee of being a clean athlete and do it the right way. I, I believe the passport over time, it's not gonna come tomorrow, but hopefully in five, 10 years, We'll be here showing you all of that data and saying this represents a clean athlete beyond any doubt. And that would be a powerful position for us to strive for in which we are. But real quick, look at how far they've come. I mean, they, they, their first year was what, the year 2000? Yeah, late 2000. And, like, and it took you a couple of years to kind of get going. Like they've come a long ways in the last decade. And before there was pretty much, you know, when I first started professional cycling, you know, there was no te barely any testing. You know, there was no test for EPO. Um, yeah, it was pretty much the wild western days. 
So we've come a long ways, and I mean, think about what's going to happen in the next decade. What you know, it's going to be, it's great, it's great. But they need support. I mean, without this guy, who knows where we'd be today? And I think, uh, yeah, it's been the truth hurts sometimes. It's unfortunate with what I, what what I did, with what some of the other cyclists did. Um, but Tyler, by the way, I, for you locals, is uh, grew up in Marblehead, Mass. Uh, where his parents are neighbors of Shalane Flanagan's Shalane Flanagan, yeah. family, the, the marathoner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I knew that Tyler was enjoying himself here in Boston when I saw him tweet a picture of Paul Revere's grave <laughs> yesterday. <Yeah. laughs> uh, I live in Montana now, but it's really nice to nice to be back here in Boston. And, um, thanks, thanks to all you guys for coming. This has been fantastic. Yeah. This Thank, you. Been Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good. Nice work.